Hello and welcome to another wonderful episode of Bug Watch. I am your boy Swissly, aka Davy, or whatever you want, really. Just call me what you fancy. I don't mind suggestions in the comments. Um, we are here today with a very special guest that I'm excited to bring on after his absolutely outstanding display at Adepticon with um, our all, I mean, I'm sure we all love it, Vanguard Onslaught. Uh, we all love it. We all like to play it. We all wish it was better. But Ben actually brought the dream. He made the meme a dream. No, he went the dream. He made the dream work is what I'm going to try and say. Um, and I'm really excited to to get Ben on to talk about it. So, Ben, how are you doing today? You good? Yeah, doing great. Good stuff. Yeah, good thanks stuff. for having me on. This is, this is super fun. It's been two weeks since the since Adepticon, right? Yeah, it has. Yeah. How How, how has the come down from from like such a cool performance and such a great event with some cool games how you've been feeling since it yeah it's it's kind of weird to go back to like your normal life after a big event like traveling all the way up to chicago playing in adepticon for the first time in a really long time um super fun event and then you know getting to uh have my list show up in random places and, and people talking about it has been kind of a surreal experience uh but super fun and I'm sure we're getting it all wrong. We're all saying, I think this is what he's doing. And actually, there's some secret sauce, I bet, I bet. No, actually, uh, your your analysis was pretty spot on. I, yes. I enjoyed watching your your last bug watch. Like, yeah, you actually see what this list is doing better than, than some of them. So, oh, Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. That's good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So you said um, the first time you've been to Adepticon in a while, Have you? You've been, is it an event you regularly go to normally or...? Yeah, so I, I started playing 40k back in like fourth edition, uh, fourth and fifth. Uh, played a lot with the the Austin Texas crew. Uh, so a lot of the guys that that used to write for Bella Lost Souls back in the day. Okay. Uh, and so we would, you know, load up a caravan and drive from Austin to Chicago pretty much every year uh, for a while back in like 2000, probably 12 to 15. Uh, so we we went for a while there, uh, but then I was out of the game for a really long time. Uh, came back in late ninth, so it's nice. probably my first Adepticon in ten years after going to it pretty regularly for a while. So just turn fun. back up and smash everyone around. Yeah, I love it. Great. Right. <laughs> and and how uh, how would how would you say the events changed in that time? It's definitely gotten a whole lot bigger. Uh, the venue was huge. Uh, the amount of other games was crazy to see. Like they had to split into two hotels because there were so many events going on. Crazy. Um, it's always been like a big 40k event and it's always been very hobby forward which is fun because they've got the golden demons are there now they've got like four other major painting competitions uh from other companies all happening at the same time as well uh i mean they had everything from like the like star wars stuff and the marvel stuff and battle tech and multiple t kinds of warhammer kill team old world everything was happening uh so you know, tens of thousands of people, crazy big event. It's super very fun. Cool. Awesome. Very cool. And you touched on it just there, you, you uh, about the uh, the Texas crew and things. What what was your, obviously you started in fourth and fifth. How were you instantly a competitive player where, as it took you a while to, to warm up to it? You know, how's, how's your journey in 40K been? Yeah, I mean, I started getting competitive pretty early on. Uh, I mean, I started when I was in, you know, middle school. So I wasn't competing then. Uh, I was in it more for the hobby, started to paint, uh, got introduced through like a library event where they were giving us models to paint. Um, but then, you know, I moved down to Texas, started playing there and that was a very, very competitive crew. Uh, so it was, it was really learning by fire, uh, yeah. jumping and playing against guys that really knew what they were doing. So even a casual match, you're playing against somebody who's prepping a list for some major event, like, you learn pretty quick. Um, but yeah, I've always really loved the competitive environment. We used to travel around a lot of big events. Uh, haven't done that as much lately with, you know, job and three kids. It, it makes it harder to go to as many events as I used to. Um, but yeah, competitive is always the way that I've loved playing these games. Uh, never really placed well in big events before, uh, but definitely gone to a lot of them. Very cool. And, and were you a Tyranid straight away, or is that just a part of your uh, repertoire of uh, factions? Tyranids is what I've hopped into on my return to the game. I was uh, a big orc player back in fifth, 
uh, and then had some side projects, played some Harlequins for a bit, uh, had a few other factions floating around, uh, but came back into ninth, jumped into uh, the Monster Mash, uh, Yormagander was was my jam in ninth edition. Very cool. Uh, Deep striking so counterfexes? No, no, I deep struck my uh, Tyranifex. Nice. The nice. Tyranifex of the Acid Spray in the backfield uh, was was a favorite move. And then just the Psychic Spam. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, back in the, when when Maliceptors were absolutely outrageously yeah. good, it was very fun. Yeah, Maliceptors, Oenthropes, the Neurothrope, giving them the three dice. It, it was a good time for, for the Psychic Phase. Ah, three dice, yeah. Wow. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and... Um, so that's that's all great. You um you said you took a couple of years out. Was that I'm I'm assuming that's kids related as well. Yeah, a uh, big part of it was actually switching systems. I played War Machine uh, for oh. a large part of that time. Uh, it's actually at an Adepticon. We got starter sets to War Machine uh, in the grab bag, nice. and my wife actually liked the game. Uh, so I sold a bunch of 40k wow. stuff, bought a bunch of War Machine stuff, and the two of us played that competitively. You can't say no. If the, if, if the wife or your partner enjoys a part of 40k, you just get them straight into it, don't you? It's Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. She had her army. She painted it up. We traveled around, played a lot of events. Um, oh, great. That's cool. And do you think that playing more um, game systems actually improves your 40k skill, coming back to it? Oh, yeah. For sure. Yeah, coming back to 40k is like riding a bike, like, the the fundamentals that you learn in playing any kind of war game is pretty translatable and so you know knowing how to to assess a board look at your positioning threat analysis all of that is pretty similar across systems so being competitive in another system definitely helps with coming back to 40k uh and hit the ground running awesome very cool very cool um, so I guess in the run-up to this Adepticon, you said it was the first time you've been to Adepticon. Had you been doing smaller events in the run-up to Adepticon? Or, um, yeah. Was this, yeah. Yeah, so been to a few smaller GTs around this part of the country uh, in Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia area. Uh, played a lot of local RTTs. Uh, there's a, a larger... Um, I guess it's a, a super major uh, Cherokee Open is oh, pretty yeah. close by. Uh, so I went to that one last year. Uh, so like definitely been playing some big events, just nothing quite to the scale of Adepticon. Not to the scale of two hotels. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so, crazy. Uh, their, their singles event is like their side event there. Oh, right. It's teams, right? And teams is the main deal. So it's like you start on Thursday with a singles event with tons of people. Uh, it's, it's pretty intense. Well, did you play the team's event as well? I did, yes. Ah, nice. Well, we'll get a bit more information about that at the end because that would be great yeah. to hear about. Sure. Um, so this the list you took, obviously, um, I think I think with Vanguard Onslaught, I think we all have the, the dream of using tons of Gene Sealers, tons of Von Ryan's yeah. Leapers, tons of everything, um, and then, you know, do, doing the thing of the reactive move and turning Lone up and... And you took a lot of those, a lot of uh, like a sprinkling of that, I would say, um, and then and then and then just like pushed in some of our best units, essentially the units that we know do great on the tabletop. Could you talk to us a bit, a little bit about that list building process um, sure. and how you got to where you were and how long it took? Like, was it a longer process or a shorter process? It'd be great yeah. to hear about. Yeah. So this list fell together pretty neatly uh, shortly after the codex dropped. Um, I was watching some tabletop titans uh, and saw them try out a vanguard list that was much heavier on the vanguard units, which mm -hmm. is more traditionally what people are running. Um, but just watching the way that they pushed forward the gene stealers, tied up the necrons in their deployment zone, they couldn't get out, they couldn't move, they couldn't score. But then eventually the necrons shot everything to death and still got on the points and made it a game. Um, so the idea came from that of like i want to be able to get up in your deployment zone super fast like that jam you out but then i still need something behind the line uh in order to stick around in the late phase of the game mm -hmm. uh, so it's like you don't need you know a ton of vanguard units in their deployment zone you need enough to stall them uh, so the idea was can I make a list that really leans into the strengths of Tyranids right now, which is secondary scoring, mm -hmm. and 
make that my full game plan. So I started looking at how many Vanguard units do I need to pull off holding you in your deployment zone for two turns, get a, a decent primary lead, and then use the rest of the list to guarantee that I'm going to come close to uh, maxing a fixed secondary every time. Uh, so, you know, the there was a couple of iterations, but the bones of the list were pretty similar the whole time. Uh, you want enough Vanguard units to get in the deployment zone, but low enough that every one of those units can be redeployed or scout uh, using the, the enhancement. Uh, and then a, a solid core of big monsters and anti-tank shooting from the Zoanthropes uh, to kind of hold the center uh, in the mid game. So put that list together, took it to an RTT, uh, immediately went 3-0. and My first ever 300-point day, I was like, oh, this list might have legs. Uh, and I've been you know, tweaking it and playing it in most events since then. It, the thing, one, one of the things you said there as well, I mean, we'll probably go into this a little bit later, but you were very keen there on getting your report, like stopping your opponent getting out of their deployment zone. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the dream, especially with the events and charge and what have you. Yeah. Um, how how important do you think going first is with that list then? Or that I mean, going out? first definitely helps. Um, but to the point where if I go first against most lists, there's very little they can do about it. Um, but going second, you still don't see a lot of lists that are fast enough to push back hard enough uh, to stop what I'm trying to do. Uh, and that redeployment is so key in making sure that you're set up okay if you do go second. So you, you put your three cheaper infiltrators up front, you pull them back, either back into strat reserve or, or just behind the line. They move up as much as they can. They get on a couple of points. You still have enough sitting out there and with the loan op to protect the gene stealers. You still get a pretty good alpha on the bottom of turn one, uh, even if you don't go first. Uh, to the point that you can screen out the objectives from, you know, whatever their second wave is. Zoanthrope's coming in turn one, kills whatever, jumped on one of the objectives, and you kind of dogpile the other one. Very cool, yeah. I mean, obviously, the, the Gene Stealers... Uh, do they have Deep Strike? I can't remember. They must do, right? They've got Fly, no? No, the Gene Stealers have Scout. Scout. So sorry, no, I mean... Sorry, I mean the... Um, did you say Zoanthrope yeah. before? I think I've gone nuts. Yeah, yeah. The, the Zoanthropes used to have Deep Strike, I think. They do not have Deep Strike anymore. Yeah, I thought so, yeah. But you can still bring them in off the table edge. and with Yeah. It, it limits the the problems with their 24-inch range because they can come in off the side. Something that was kind of safe from your front, mm-hmm. it's not safe from six stone throats coming in from the side turn no, one. No, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. And, and did you think about uh, how much of the terrain play in your list building? Because obviously it's a, it was GW yeah. terrain, right? It, it was the GW layout, which I was not super practiced on. Um, a lot of what we play around here is player placed, like Cherokee is player placed. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the, the nearby like GTs, RRTTs are all player placed. Uh, so that's what I had more practice into. Uh, the, the GW terrain, this was my first event playing on it. Uh, and I like it enough yeah. that I think our local events are going to start trying out some GW terrain. Um, because it, it is pretty nice and balanced. Like you don't get some of the weird things you can get with some player placed. Uh, but I, I think it was certainly helpful for a melee list like mine to have that kind of terrain. Like there was lots of great spots to stage some gene stealers before they got in. Yeah, it's not too prohibitive for monsters either, right? Because they can go over the ruins yeah. that don't have walls. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we we had um, I was at the Goonhammer Open, which had similar ish uh, to GW. And it just unlocks the ability to take a flying hive tyrant because in the UK, with UK TC, you just can't take one because mm-hmm. they'll just get shot from wherever, or anywhere on the table, essentially, because they're too big. Um, but having that that ruin is is so pivotal for a Tyranid army at the moment, I think, because it just says, hey, you can now unlock tons of uh, tons of units. Yeah. Um, very cool. Okay. Well, without, without further ado, let's have a look at the list. Uh, let me... Yeah. Just share my screen. All right, nice. Let me add it to screen. Okay. Nope, that's not how we do that. 
No, oh, no. It's all going wrong. We'll just do that for the moment. We'll just do that. That works. It's fine. You know, fans of the channel will know that I'm not technically adept. Um, cool. All right. So uh, let's 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 take us through the list, Ben. See, tell us because it would be great to get it from your your from the from how because I've put it into little groups here, but mm -hmm. I imagine I've got this all wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I I generally think about my list in terms of who's playing what role rather than, you know, grabbing just the, the best units and, and putting them in. Um, so like it, it's obviously missing some of the, the classic Vanguard units like Warriors of the Prime, Gargoyles. Uh, some of those units just didn't feel like they were fitting any of the roles that I was looking for. Uh, so to start with, we have our Vanguard units. Uh, so we've got the things that are going to want to get in there early. Uh, so we've got the Death Leaper, of course. He's just a very good version of a Lictor. Uh, I went with two of the regular Lictor uh, and one Neuro Lictor. That's a mix that I've, I've kind of played around with a little bit. Uh, I know a lot of people are running like the double or triple Neuro Lictor, uh, but I do like the Lictors being able to get in and tie things down better, uh, which the Neuro Lictor doesn't necessarily do super well. So the Neuro likes to sit on a point. The, the regular Lictors get in and, and tie things up. Uh, we've got three. Got one sorry, just on that, Ben, really interesting point you've brought. I don't want to miss it. So yeah. what what is your ideal target for a Lictor to go and tie up? So obviously, if they've got any units out in the open with a leader, you want to go in and assassinate those as quick as possible because you can strip off a lot of really good buffs from things if you put a Lictor or two into it. Yep, Technomancer, um, rip. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You get the Technomancer uh, against Chaos. You know, you, I've sniped out a bunch of the chaos lord with hammer uh before they could really get going um in the the world leaders game took out one of the masters of execution like there's just a lot of good characters that you want to snipe mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times those aren't going to just be sitting out there on turn one though so uh i do like putting lictors into um any kind of a scoring unit especially i really like going after whatever your action monkey is should get killed by a lictor okay uh, very you, nice it's not going to take out a full marine unit. It's not going to take out a ten man without dying. Um, but if you got scouts or infiltrators or uh, hex marks or, or whatever your little thing is that's going to try to to score you points, I'm going to go kill that first. Correct. Uh, if you don't have any of that available, uh, vehicles. Because uh, a, a vehicle is not going to kill a lictor in melee, uh, but you can keep it from moving. If you're kind of standing the lictor between the vehicle and a gap in a ruin. Uh, they have to fall back if they want to go anywhere, um, and you kind of jam them out from going through ruins. Really like that. Very cool. So then uh, one of the other fun ones on the, the kind of vanguard side is the Von Ryan's Leapers. Uh, I'm only bringing three. Uh, they're not very good. <laughs> uh, I, I see people bringing like double six man. Like, they're not going to kill anything. That's not their job. Um, they are my first drop if the other person has any infiltrating units to kind of grab as much space up the middle as I can. Um, and the really nice thing about Von Ryan's is that they are a move 10 unit with infiltrate. Uh, so they can stand nine inches away from the enemy deployment zone. If you get first turn, uh, there's no way that your opponent can stop you from scoring deploy teleport homers turn one because they, they can't screen it up. They walk 10. They're now within the enemy deployment zone. They deploy a homer. It's a good use of 75 points, right? Exactly. Yeah, three points there. And then they can, you know, stand again, stretch three models between two ruins uh, that the enemy was hiding behind. And it really limits their movement to get out on the board. Very cool. Uh, of course, we got the Gene Stealers, we got the Brood Lord uh, scouting, then advancing and charging uh, gets them into play pretty easily. Uh, and then we've got the Winged Hive Tyrant as the, the last of the, the Vanguard uh, tagged units. Uh, I really like the Winged Hive Tyrant. It's a bit of a, a pet unit of mine. Ends up in lists that it probably shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> but I do love my, my Flyrant. Uh, in this case, he does a pretty good job of uh, kind of bullying something. He's not going to get a turn one charge usually unless I get a really good advance roll. Uh, but he can post up on the center objective while keeping the gene stealers in his aura. Uh, so 
it really makes the gene stealers more reliable if you can get that free uh, CP reroll on either the advance or the charge. Uh, really makes them reliable on getting in that turn one. Uh, and then the flyer can sit there and, and reduce the attacks coming back on them. Really, yeah, that's a really good combo. Yeah, because obviously I think in the in the game you went into Angron, right? No, no, the flyer wasn't able to get in there in time, but he stood back and helped the gene stealers out. So the gene stealers combo charged the Angron and the eight bound, and the tyrant made the eight bound uh, minus one attack. The Broodlord made a minus one to hit, and suddenly they're not as scary anymore. Uh, so it's I a really good that. combo, right? Um, it's so good. Uh, a lot of times, if if I'm not getting way up in there, the flyer will hang back a little bit with the um, the mouse scepter uh, for a similar combo. As anytime you can get the minus one to hit, minus one attack, it really neuters a lot of threats. Very cool. And you put chame chameleonic on the wing type wing type tyrant. Is that just you add the points left, or is that specifically no, specific? Buff? I like it on him because he dies to shooting. He doesn't mm -hmm. die in melee a ton, uh, but any protection you can give him against shooting on the way in uh, is pretty helpful. Uh, I've thought about doing hunting grounds on him, but he does die fairly early uh, in a lot of games. Uh, so the, the hunting grounds doesn't get quite as much mileage out uh, as the chameleonic. Absolutely, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah, hunting grounds, obviously, probably the best, um, what would you call it? Uh, like, I was going to say warlord trait there. There's my ninth coming out. Enhancement, there right. we go. Yeah. It's probably the best enhancement for my money in Vanguard Onslaught. I bet that was painful yeah, to not include, exactly. given given the current meta threats, right? Yeah. I mean, Neuronode is a must-take. You have to have that redeploy. Uh, yeah. It's by far the best of the enhancements. That's fair. Okay. Hunting Grounds is very good, but I don't have a good carrier for it. Mm -hmm. uh, is that it would re require taking another character, and I'm not sure what a good drop would be to take somebody else just to hold the Hunting Grounds. 100%. Uh, you know, there, there's some places to experiment with that, but I haven't found a good one yet. Fair. So yeah, that, that's kind of the the front line, uh, the vanguard, as you will. Um, which you know, I like like these lists that have all vanguard. Like that's not what a vanguard is supposed to do. Like the the classic definition of a vanguard is is your advance force. So you need to have an army behind it. Uh, so we've got the the meaty center here, uh, where I take my double har specs, mal scepter, and twelve zone thropes. Uh, that walk up the middle and, and hold ground, uh, which, you know, I, it's weird maybe seeing a list that doesn't have the, the double exocrine uh, or triple exocrine. Uh, we got the, the har specs instead. Uh, I don't feel like I need the shooting threat in this list that the exocrines bring. Uh, the mouse or the, the har specs are just big, tough, lots of wounds. And if you get close to them, they'll crack into a lot of things. Mm. For 125 points, they're the new distraction card effects. They do a very good job at doing their job. Uh, they can survive better than people expect, and then they crack back really hard with those 18 attacks. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's one of those. I think from the when the when the index originally came out, and everyone was like, "Whoa, 100 and I think there were 135 to start with." I think everyone was like, "This is crazy. This is so such good value." Yeah. Um, but but then you've never really seen them in lists, and I remember seeing yours in the battle in the um, on War Games Live, and I was like, "Whoa, here we go, too! Yeah, let's do it." Um, yeah. So no, great, great that you've uh, that you've used those. Um, I suppose the terrain was very useful for them as well. Is there anything else that 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 stands out from them in terms of usefulness, or is it just a big bag of wounds that will hit back quite hard? I mean, that, that's really their main job. Like, the tongue hardly ever does anything. Uh, you know, it occasionally snipe something, which is kind of fun when it happens. Uh, but really, they're there to, they sit on the midpoints. Uh, so generally, turn one, the two of them will both advance onto uh, kind of the two flanks, uh, onto the, the two objectives nearby, uh, and just sit on them. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, early on, I'm going to try to use the zone thropes and the... Uh, Gene stealers while they're still alive uh, to kill whatever the biggest one or two anti tank things are uh, on the other side, which then limits what they've got left that can realistically threaten three big monsters. Makes sense. Makes sense. And of course, the mouse scepter is good. Everyone runs them. We, yeah. we all know what they do. Uh, having just one of them is fine. Um, we love to have space for more, but 
but I don't feel like I've got the room to, to try to squeeze another one in. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of points. It's a lot of points. Um, he, he's a chunk. Uh, he's great at killing some of the meta things, though. Like, people are bringing more Terminators, Custodes, Grey mm -hmm. Knights. Like, three damage attacks are good. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you, um, you, do, you do have space for another one with the Trigon, but you opted for a Trigon instead, which uh, yeah, I think cool. I think Trigons are one of those like low-key Marmite uh, decisions. Some Tyranny players love them and others yeah. hate them. I'm firmly in the love them camp, but uh, it'd be great. Let, what was your thinking behind the Trigon? Yeah, so, so kind of away from the meaty center, but the rest is focused on scoring. Okay. Uh, so, so like I said, I really wanted to make sure that this list initially was all about scoring those secondary points. I, I'm going to get as close to 40 points as possible every game, even if you're trying to stop me. Uh, so, you know, we've got the Biovore. Uh, obviously, everyone takes the, the one Biovore to get the Spore Mines in. Uh, but then, you know, the you need the, the backups for if the Biovore gets taken out uh, or if your opponent can screen well. Uh, so that's what the Trigon is there for. Uh, he's he's one of the, the scoring team. Uh, even if your opponent screens out for the, uh, the Spore Mines, the Trigon can still get in there with a three-inch Deep Strike. Uh, and, and even just the, the threat of a three-inch Deep Strike on the Trigon uh, actually seems to make opponents focus less uh, resources on screening out. So, you know, they, they realize that a three-inch could come in. They don't work as hard to screen the nine. Um, which lets the the spore mines get in and do work, uh, but even if they do screen nine inches in the deployment zone, you know, especially because they're jammed back in their deployment zone, if things are going well, uh, the trigon can still pop in uh, and do the deploy teleport homers. Uh, so for one CP on turn one, you know, we can pop him in and get seven victory points. And it's especially easy as well, I think, because a lot of people might not be aware, but you can actually, you don't need to be wholly within your opponent's deployment zone to do a deploy teleport homer. Mm -hmm. And because of the Trigon's big base, you can definitely get its big toe in there just to, to right. press that button, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very, very difficult to screen an entire deployment zone for three inches when, when I just have to be partially within to get points. Uh, the behind enemy lines, you do have to be wholly in, but... Uh, a lot of times there's a still a space for that big base, but as soon as people realize that you have a three inch, they, they kind of loosen up on, on screening in general. So it's usually pretty easy to, to get him in somewhere. And, and just on this, so you've, you've said uh, deploy teleport homers and behind enemy lines. Are they mm -hmm. the ones you take in every single mission? Yes. Yeah, pretty much always uh, just those two. I've tried with some of the other fixed objectives. Uh, I really don't like taking any of the killy ones, even if they've got a bunch of characters or vehicles. Um, Tyranids are not the best at killing things. Like, we're not going to table anybody uh, unless things go really well in our favor. Um, so I don't want my secondary score to be reliant on doing really well on the head-to-head -head fight. Like so. if I'm doing badly at the head dead fight, I need that release valve of good secondary scoring. Uh, so it's got to be the positional ones. Okay. Uh, and, you know, spore mines. If there's an opening, that's seven points a turn just with a single spore mine uh, doing deploy in the in the deployment zone. Uh, so it's worked out pretty well with that. Uh, and like I said, I designed the list to really maximize that. So, so there's a lot of thought into how can I continually get stuff into their deployment zone mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, the backup swarm, the pyrovore, the biovores, uh, the trigon, and then up and downing any infantry that's still alive late game uh, usually has something that can get in the deployment zone and do those two objectives. No, that's, that's really good. And actually, yeah, I've never really thought that of that stratagem as a as a way into behind him, like, like as a late game, okay, I'm going to need this. I'm going to save this CP because I'm going to need it to get that, that score late game. That's really interesting. Cool. Yeah. Especially with all of our loan ops. So like you pick up a lictor after it's done its job of, of distracting something, hold it in reserves until you've run out of good scoring units and then throw it into the deployment zone. It's got loan up. It can be a six inch loan op. Like it's very hard for them to scalp it out uh, late game. Very cool. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the list then. Yep. Yeah, that, that's all of them. Yeah. That, that, I mean, it's not. I, I still get a lot of my friends when I when I play Tyranids 
a lot that always say like you get it feels like you get a lot of stuff when you're a tyranny player compared to some other armies i'm just having a little hiatus with world eaters at the moment and i just don't have many units i don't have many much things at all compared to my tyranny days but i tell you what it's helping my back out a little bit um <laughs> all those models definitely does get you back um great so with this list you then went into the event um and then did you have any goals for the event did you have anything you were thinking okay this is what i'd love to achieve um going into adeptcom yeah i mean i i like to make goals for an event but i like to be pretty conservative with my goals uh like uh like i said i haven't really topped very many events in the past uh so going in my goal is always to go positive uh so in this case that would be a three in one uh run uh, and this year because adepticon is a very hobby forward uh event uh i did a, a display board got that already so i had a goal of, of you know uh getting some eyes on the army having people stop and take photographs like if i could get somebody to stop and photo my army while they're they're looking at all the cool stuff at adepticon that would be a win uh and then for the team tournament we were going in looking for uh winning the, the sportsmanship and team spirit awards if we could oh brilliant that's really cool man that's really cool yeah. um i think we all dream of that positive win rate um don't we i think it's uh, everyone's like yeah as long as we go positive um exactly yeah but, and but your first five games was uh was was, was obviously that way so then yeah. you, you obviously pull uh canoptic i mean you know you get your parents I don't, when were the parents done for adepticon like that morning oh it, were they it, that? so you don't have time to dwell on it no no they they put up the pairings and they're like all right get to your tables uh oh, so wow, you yeah. know just give me a list as i'm i'm walking up to the the spot uh i was definitely intimidated by this one uh is prepping for this event uh went to a, a nearby gt did really well there but lost uh in round four to a, a necrons hypercrypt with the satan uh and just i struggled to kill them fast enough and it was a mission where they could really uh get a lot of points at the end one of the ones with the disappearing objectives so you know having just lost to to necrons uh and missing out on, on probably winning that gt um it was intimidating for sure uh so yeah this was a canoptic court uh with uh what was it three satan uh three doom stalkers uh, double race with the attached characters uh, and some of the little anthracites, the the little meltagun guys. Uh, so it was a, a fairly intimidating looking list. Not exactly how I wanted to start off the day. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I spent the 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 meta's big bad at the, at the time as well, right? So yeah, exactly. And you know, the the guy had a beautiful display board. He he had his team jersey. Like he clearly knew what he was doing. Uh, so. Sometimes you go into an event round one, you, you hit somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. It's their first GT, whatever. Like nice softball to start. This was not that. No. Um, so yeah, it was it was good. Uh, so he got first turn, uh, which is you know not what you want to see when you're running this kind of a vanguard list into to a big bad list. Uh, so on my turn one, I was actually able to bring in the zoanthropes and took out one of the doomstalkers with some decent rolls. Nice. Uh, which, you know, he had spread them out. So there was kind of one in each part of his Dawn of War deployment. So taking out that, took out kind of the whole corner of his deployment zone. So everything else had come forward. Uh, and I assume that was screening as well, right? So then there's your screen, his screen right. gone. There's, there's a big hole there. I drop in a spore mine there. He has really very little resources to go back and deal with that spore mine. Uh, so in turn two, his anthracites move forward further, kill my biovore. I've got a transcendent behind me. Uh, I've got the... <laughs> Uh, the other Satan are the Void Dragon is center. Uh, the Nightbringer is on the flank where I just brought in the Zone Thropes. Uh, the Nightbringer charges a Harspex, almost kills it, fails to kill it. Harspex slaps back, does some damage. Then on my turn with the fallback and charge, hop out, shoot it with all the Zone Thropes over there. It was like nine Zone, nine zone Thropes plus the Harspex, get back in there and finish them off. Uh, so now I've got that whole flank to myself, pretty much. Uh, the the gene stealers get the the precision uh, strap for free. They kill out the characters in one of the wraith units. We mop that up when they don't have feel no pain anymore, uh, and from there just really set up well on the the center and flank. Pretty uh, And he wasn't able to really come back. The trigon took his home objective, started burning it. It was scorched earth. 
uh, and he never was able to go back and kill that one little spore mine uh, that was, you know, behind a ruin. Pushing the boy in every time. Yes, yes. He's doing his job. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, you, you know, you've skipped over it there, but I think a really nice little synergy for that Harrispex there is that Harrispex will survive a punch in mm -hmm. combat a lot of the time. And actually having the fallback and charge is so powerful for that. And that's a really nice little synergy there. Maybe Vanguard Onslaught was the, the detachment the Harrispex needed all along, right? Right. Yeah, <laughs> the fallback and charge is actually quite a big deal. And, mm. you know, we, we gloss over it a little bit when we look at Vanguard because it it's not the Vanguard part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't matter with the tags, but when you're running a monster core, the fallback and charge is great because it means that you're always getting the charge attacks. Because even if something goes and hits your monsters, you know, Mouse Scepter, Heart Specs, they don't die to the first charge usually. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're, you're fighting something that's really good at cracking them, uh, which hopefully we've taken out by then by with Gene Stealers and Zone Thropes. Uh, so the fallback and charge on everybody is just so clutch in a lot of situations. Absolutely, especially in that Necron matchup where uh, mm -hmm. they, they, then. Um, sometimes they're not, they're, they're very survivable, but they don't always come across as very killy. Like the, yeah. you think of Wraith blobs and things like that. So yeah. interesting. Great. So, so overall, yeah, you, you kind of took the flank, you took his home objective, you burned it, uh, which I always think is the biggest meme, right? If you just, burn, if you burnt your home objective, you've already won, right? It's yeah, like, exactly. he's already dead, but it seems like, um, seems like you got the right end of the, uh, you got a right, the right kind of strategy in that matchup to. Yeah, you know they don't. Have, he doesn't have enough assets, so you can just take out little corners and then yeah. nibble away at them. And like I said earlier, like especially into somebody like Necrons, the goal is to kill the scoring units. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we're 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 not going to go toe to toe with all the Satan. I left the Transcendent completely alone. Never put a wound on him. It's fine. He can run around and do his thing. But you kill all the small stuff, mm -hmm. uh, and you you kill that as quick as possible. And then you start focusing on one big thing at a time and see how much you can push back. Like you're not going to table Necrons, but you can limit their scoring to the point where they're not getting secondary points while your spore mine is doing its job. Absolutely, that's great advice. Great advice. Um, and then you got your round two uh, into mm -hmm. into Drakari, which I've, I've termed here good stuff. It just seems like all the stuff you see in a Drakari list. Um, yeah, so I mean, very different challenge. Which is, you know, it's a fun detachment. Uh, they had. You know, they had Lilith and uh, what's his name, the, the character Archon, uh, oh. Drazar, Drakizar, whatever his yeah, name Drazar, is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they had, you know, Triple Incubi, Double Archons, uh, a bunch of boats, uh, and then a bunch of Talos's. Uh, so, you know, all the all the big things, um, lots of Dark Lances running around. Uh, this game was kind of funny. I, I told my opponent several times during the game, I've never done this well while rolling this badly. Uh, <laughs> I really flubbed a lot of things in that game. Uh, but just positionally, it was very hard for him to get into a good position uh, against the kind of stuff that was in the list. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, went second, uh, which was kind of a theme for the, the event. Uh, <laughs> so he's pushing up with a lot of fast stuff. Uh, it's way harder to hold down Dark Eldar than than some of the other armies out there. Yeah, um, especially if they go first with all the the transports and and fast things. Uh, I had Lictor fail to kill a unit of uh, Mandrakes over like three rounds of combat. Just... Oh wow! I thought one round of combat I was like no, two, no, two well maybe, but like three rounds of combat. Wow! Yeah, it took a really long time to kill them. Um, I had a Trigon fail to kill a unit of Mandrakes in, in a round of melee uh, with you know, 12 attacks, hitting on threes, wounding on twos. Didn't matter. Uh, had a Har Spex charge. Uh, Drazar and his Incubi killed two Incubi. Uh, and on the slap back got killed. Uh, oh. So, I mean, there, there was a lot of just misses in that game. Uh, but there was enough positional and, and target analysis that I think went well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I dropped the zone tropes in early and actually just picked up the whatever those are called, the flying Dark Lance dudes. Oh, scourges. The Scourges. So we had a unit of Scourges, was able to get a line on them with the uh, zone tropes coming out of reserves. Took out, you know, five Dark Lances in, in one shot, which is pretty good. Very cool. Uh, at one point, he had moved some stuff forward to deal with Death Leaper and some other Lictor type things. 
So he had a, his venom kind of forward on his uh, home objective uh, to drop them out and let them get back in the boat when they were done with their their doing. Mm -hmm. But that left a hole for the Trigon, uh, who pops up on his home objective, flips that. Yeah. And it's oh. a mission where you get more points for holding the, the objectives further along the map. Uh, so I managed to zero him on primary for two turns while I scored his home objective for two turns. Oh, and that what a good me. spot that was. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. So, so doing that pretty much sealed the deal. Uh, was able to screen out with my uh, Biovore uh, instead of really scoring with it because I had enough other lictors and things that were running around the deployment zone, mm -hmm. uh, which made it so there was only one spot on the board he could even bring his Ravagers in on, and it wasn't anywhere near my monsters. Uh, which really helped just to have that board control of being able to spread out so many little cheap units that are hard to to shoot at. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, brilliant. Great stuff. Oh, well, that seems like it was a fairly, yeah, fairly straightforward matchup in that sense. I get what you Like, it would, it would have been different maybe if he left the Ravagers on the board, no, to start with. Yeah. Yeah, because I've been in the same situation where I've, I've reserved Exocrines against Custodies, and then I'm like, why did I do that? Um, you know, you always think, oh, well, I'll get a good angle, but actually right. if the game's already gone, then it's already gone, yeah. especially with um, he, screen. He was concerned about me picking off the Ravagers before they were able to do stuff with the zone throps coming in. True, uh, yeah, true. So, so he was figuring, you know, number one, you get a good angle probably, and number two, you don't lose a fragile boat to last cannon shots before mm -hmm. it gets to its thing. Uh, but when there's no spot for you to pull it in, it, it's hard. Absolutely. Absolutely. First, you have to make that decision before you see, you know, all the infiltrators that are, are straining things out. And if you haven't oh. played against Vanguard, you don't realize just how much board space we take up. Yeah. I mean, it's a lose lose scenario. If he did one thing, you know, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you, you win that game and then you go into um, an Ultramarine's Iron Storm list. Yeah. Yeah. So he was running, what, like five dreadnoughts, a speeder, uh, two of the, the like, super anti-infantry versions of the the executioner thing uh i forget what the variant is called but it it's it's not the the one with the big las cannons on top it's got like 30 shots or something like that on it's not a repulse it's um oh i can't think now but yeah that one yeah it's it's, it's like the alternate like it's one of the like forge world variant type ones so we had two of those uh just lots and lots of shots uh we were playing on the ritual which helped a lot. Um, and again, he got first turn. Uh, he made a an objective with the scouts, uh, but all my stuff was pretty well hidden or low knot. Uh, mm -hmm. So he wasn't able to do a ton on turn one. So my turn one, everything comes running out. We kill all the scouts on that objective and we kill uh, two other scout units. So he's really out of good ritual units at that point. And point scores, as you said, right? Yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to kill all the tanks, but I immediately kill all of his scouts and tie up one of his tech marines in melee, uh, who then fails his morale check and he doesn't want to follow it back and lose the enhancement because uh, Death Leaper is there making him scared. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he ends up just staying in combat, which means the Gene Stealers live for another turn because they can't get shot while they're in melee with that tech marine. Uh, and so they just wreck havoc on the tanks back there without being able to get shot by the uh, very scary tank. Uh, the, on this one, I did not kill very many of his vehicles. I killed the two tanks. I killed the speeder. Uh, I don't think I killed any dreadnoughts. Uh, but, Easier said than done, right? I mean, it, yeah. the Redemptors are real tough now in this edition. Yeah, they're, they're chunky. Um, and I lost some zone throps. You know, they, they got up there and killed some tanks and they got shot down by big plasma guns. Uh, but the Har Spexes were sitting in the back just making a whole bunch of ritual objectives, and he didn't have a lot of good ritual creators. Um, and I'm just dropping a spore mine a turn in his backfield because uh, I, I cleaned up one flank pretty well that had scouts and a land speeder and one tank on it. Uh, pretty much killed that whole corner. Uh, so it was just a scoring game at that point. Uh, he wasn't probably aggressive enough with his dreadnoughts. They probably needed to come around the ruins and start mixing it up to get me off of objectives. Uh, but the hard specs were threatening enough that he didn't want to do that. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It'd be, it's a, you know, it's a threat for a, a redemptor to go into a hard specs. Absolutely. Um, 
Ah, that's very cool. And of course, if I mean, did you take behind and uh, deploy in this mission? Yeah, because mm -hmm. I think some people might have thought with them um, with a, with the the big base of a Harrisbacks, you could maybe have even done cleanse and cleanse two objectives yeah. at the same time. But I think I think if if you've built this list to literally get on into their deployment zone, and yeah. in, interestingly, you're gonna probably deny their ritual uh, their objective creating and even primary mm -hmm. with the way that the game panned out right right and with ritual you don't score anything on your home objective so you've got to come out and build those ritual objectives yeah and anything that you build out there like my my first wave is going to get on it on turn one uh so i you know i scored off of his objective on turn two uh so you know, yeah Ow. and two uh and and that really set him back pretty hard uh yeah and like you said cleanse was maybe a possibility but at the same time i don't want to incentivize my opponent to take those objectives i need them their focus split uh like that that's multiple wins for them if they kill a heart specs very true yeah where behind enemy lines you got to focus one of your tanks on going and killing a spore mine uh to keep me from scoring and that feels bad uh, you'd, you'd much rather be killing our specs. Yeah, once all those scouts did it, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, very cool, man, very cool. Um, so then you take that as another win, um, and then you went into a really interesting CSM list, which had a yeah. ton of bikes, uh, warp talons, and some uh, some tanks in there as well. Um, yeah, that was interesting. This is the first time I've played against Chaos since they got the, the nerfs in that last data slate. Uh, so, you know, we're not doing the, the triple possessed, triple forge fiend stuff that we've seen before. Uh, this one was definitely an interesting list. Uh, you know, he's running four big tanks with the Hellbrute and Abaddon, giving them all those buffs. Uh, and they're all Nurgle. So they're, you know, on fives, they're getting lethal sustained hits with big guns. Uh, and all the rerolls and the dark packs and all that is happening. Uh, so it, it definitely puts out a lot of damage and then he's got his scoring units of, of warp talons and bikes uh, to run around and score stuff uh it's definitely an interesting list uh you know he'd done real well up to that point uh i actually played this guy on stream as well on the patreon stream uh so that was very fun as it was kind of a stretch goal of mine like if i could be on stream that would be awesome never been on stream before it would be cool uh so got on the patreon stream with that one uh this time was the first time in the event that I went first, which was great. Uh, and we were on uh, the the table quarters deployment. So he was kind of on that GW terrain. You've got two ruins that kind of form a uh, point that fill yeah. up a lot part of your table quarter. So he had all his tanks back there uh, and, and everything was kind of turtled up behind it because there really wasn't a ton of options with some nurglings out front to screen a little bit. Uh, but, you know, with the table quarter deployment, you can really get aggressive with the vanguard units and, and there's a lot of staging points there uh so i was able to uh, get into his deployment zone with a few things uh the, the von ryan just walked in and deployed the homers because it was pretty screened out but they can just walk their 10 deploy homers uh the gene stealers got in on one of his tanks to be behind enemy lines um and they scratched the tank a little bit they didn't really <laughs> do enough to it uh, and Elictor killed most of a warp talent unit. So not a lot of killing, but, you know, I was up in his face. Everything's tied up behind these big ruins. So his tanks have a real hard time coming out and doing anything for a turn or two. Absolutely. Uh, so he spends a lot of resources trying to deal with my secondary scoring. Because he sees what the list is trying to do. He spends a lot of focus with cultists and other things, screening out his deployment the whole game, making sure that he's killing the small stuff that gets in there. Uh, Every turn I'm sending something in, we got lictors running in, we got the tyrant running in, we got random stuff just running into the deployment zone and dying. Uh, but, you know, scoring me my points every time. Uh, the Biovore is shooting spore mines that can't get in the deployment zone, but they can get close enough that they can walk in the next turn. So we got kind of oh, like a yeah. spore mine working their way in. So even with a ton of effort to try to keep me from scoring secondary, I still get like 30. Um, and he wasn't able to get out of his corner to really stop my primary score, uh, which which got out of hand. By the end of the game, he did just about table me because uh, those tanks hit really hard with all the buffs that they were getting. Uh, so all the monsters are dead. The zone threats are all dead. Uh, 
the biovore died to some bikes popping up behind it and killing it. Um, but at that point, it was too late. Mm. Nice. It seems like, yeah, that early aggression just hamstrung him for the rest of the game, right? Yeah. Yeah, just you spend one or two turns like that where you can't get your tanks out from behind the line of sight blockers uh, and you're not on primary points and it, it's too hard to catch up. Absolutely. Great stuff. Nice. Um, and then you went into uh, a kind of version of the 1975 Worldies list, but it was a 2000 point one. Um, but yeah, like not an easy list at all to go into. And this was the one that was on uh, Wargames Live actual stream. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is a great, I mean, it was a great game to watch. And I know that a lot of people were glued to it, glued to the screen. We were chatting about it in the Discord. Uh, but it'd be great to hear it from your perspective, Ben. Yeah, that was a really fun game. And like I said, it's always been something that I was hoping to do to get on a stream game. Uh, and to have one that goes that well uh, was, was super fun. Um, you know, the, the thing with the world eaters is you really need to focus on a couple of units at a time uh, and, and limit their mobility. Like they don't have a ton of scoring units. They're going to come and try to, to punch you in the face as fast as they can. Uh, so in this case, I was able to go first, which was very helpful. Uh, but I think even going second, like because of the, the infiltrators that I have that are cheap throwaway units, you can really limit their scout moves um, and can keep stuff protected for a good counter punch on bottom of one. Uh, but going first definitely helps. Uh, he immediately rolls snake eyes on the leadership check from the, the uh, Neurolector on uh, Angron. So he's like, all right, we're killing Angron this turn then. Uh, zone Thropes come in, shoot him almost to death. Gene Sailors finish him off. Uh, like that was a big one. Uh, making sure that you get Engron out of there early is big. You don't want to spend resources and leave him alive um, because that causes huge problems. Um, and then the rest of his stuff got tied up pretty well with the the first Vanguard wave. Uh, so like the the Lictors getting up in there, the fights first helped me snipe out uh, a Master of Executions, which was big. Uh, you know, he, he did chew through most of that first wave, but it took him two turns to do it, uh, while I'm scoring primary behind him. Um, he took out my whole right flank pretty well with, uh, some exalted eight bound and a full berserker unit, uh, took out pretty much all the zone thropes that I had over there and the har specs who, who died, you know, to the wound, uh, like him being able to crack back there would have really flipped that side. Uh, so I just went with the old refused flank strategy and just gave up that whole side, shuffled everything over to the left, uh, and really hunkered down on the other objectives. Um, cause at that point, you know, the berserkers really want to be going and killing things, but he also needs them to hold a point because he has nothing else over there to hold that point. Uh, so, you know, them trying to come forward into the center that I'm holding with more zoanthropes, a har specs and a mal scepter. Uh, was just they just walked into a meat grinder, like absolutely. They, I mean, the malice have to debuff in them as well, like it's just a yeah, yeah. yeah so that, that got them the flyer was amazing in this matchup, is when the, there aren't las cannons or anything to take him down. So he was just hopping around, killing eight bound with his three damage attacks, then into some berserkers, killing those, then into uh, Lord Avocado, killing him. Definitely like, the star of the show, just yeah, absolutely day. maiming around, just yeah, ideal, ideal. Especially when everyone's down on the Flying Hive Tyrant, having him on stream, just going absolute ham and killing half of an army. Having a point to prove that, you definitely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that one was super fun. And, you know, having all the guys back home on our Discord, just commenting on the game and, and cheering for it. And uh, just the, the comments online, lots of people liking the paint job, which was a huge win for me. Um, you know, it was, it was really fun. There was loads of comments in um, in War Games Live about that. Yeah, so so well done on that. Yeah, um, great, cool. So that was the the game on stream. Definitely recommend going to watch it because that was very fun. And then you went into TJ Lanigan's uh, T Suns. So you know the final boss, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Yeah. TJ is a really great player. Um, so he was actually on my team uh, for the teams event. So. Oh, brilliant! Oh, right. Okay. We're here in the, the top eight fighting each other, and then the next two days we're, we're playing together. Uh, so, you know, he's a great guy. Uh, he really knows what he's doing with his list. Uh, and I think it, it was a bit of a rough match for me. Um, 
but even with all of that, like only losing by 15 points, I was yeah, pretty yeah. proud. Uh, like the, the list performed well. Uh, I think on that one, we both agreed after the game, if I had gone first, I, I take that game, no problem. Uh, but him going first with the disc sorcerers, being able to make, you know, when you've got a detachment that's all about advance and charge, you have something that halves your movement and your advance and your charge roll. It's going to be a rough time. And it wants uh, you out in the open as well, so it can just pump mortals into you. And yeah. Yeah. yeah so he, he goes first and he slows down all my important Vanguard stuff with the three sorcerers. Um, he gets some good Doom Bolts where he's like just picking up lictors with one shot with a Doom Bolt multiple yeah. times. Uh, I had an absolutely horrible turn two where all 12 zone throw shots do a grand total of zero wounds uh, to the things that they're shooting into. Uh, and then a horror specs charges the mutilith void beast and fails to kill it. Uh, and, you know, from there it was just, can I, how many points can I score while he's just walking me off the table? He um, really was unable to do much to his cabal points. He still had almost all of them by the end, mm -hmm. killed a couple of sorcerers and that was it. Um, but still well, that's a testament to your list building, right? The fact that you were only lost by 15 points and, uh, you know, and you were literally just pushing points to the end and, and given some of the luck you've had there in the Lichter dying and the, yeah, the, 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 the big mouth face off between the mutually vortex beast and a, and a, <laughs> a respects. Yeah. So I think, you know, if I go first there and I'm not slowed down on my Vanguard, like, I'm at least pinning him in his deployment zone, Absolutely. even with all of his spells and stuff. Like he'll kill my stuff, but that would more than make up the points that that I was down there. Yeah. Um, and that's a more comfortable place yeah. for you to be, given the tournament you've had. Right? Is pumping yeah. stuff in there. It dies. That's fine. Next thing goes in. It dies. It's fine. Yeah, you know, exactly. it's all those points that you're scoring. So, ah, oh, it's a, it's a real shame. Yeah, it was, it was disappointing to lose that close to the end, but you know, losing to my teammate is fine. Yeah. Um, and you know, at that point, I got to, to take the rest of the afternoon off and enjoy the the con and get ready for the the team's event the next day. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a great finish, way way better than I could have anticipated going. Um, I think if I had won that game, I had a decent shot of going all the way. Uh, mm. Next it would have been the hypercrypt list, which just like I've now dealt with hypercrypt and I have a very good plan into them. And he didn't have a ton of the scoring units. Um, I was pretty confident in my ability to handle that style of hypercrypt. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the, the final would have been against Brandon Valley, who's very, very good. But Tau, if I go first, it, it's going to be bad for the Tau. Yeah, you're going to really... Yeah, that, that's a, that, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a rough one for the, for the Tau if you get first. Uh, even if he goes first, I can loan out the important stuff and, and maybe still pull it out. So, Yeah, I have to say, it's a funny match. Uh, when I was playing Vanguard Onslaught, like... The the tower market was pretty good because you've just it's all about pre measuring where they can go and and just going yeah. okay fine so you can you can't shoot anything again this turn and now this turn and then I'm and then you know right. worst case scenario by turn three you're completely over them um, it's a really interesting matchup yeah and, sure. and a, a breath of fresh air after ninth edition <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, awesome very cool so obviously that's that's the the tournament over. Mm -hmm. And you've, as you've said, you're still really pleased with, with how you do, and you're sure you should be. Yeah. Is there anything then um, that you're thinking about for your next event, or, or when is your next event? And will you be taking the same list, or is there anything you're gonna gonna change up? Yeah, so I've been throwing around some ideas for changing it. Um, the bones of the list are gonna stay the same. Uh, it's it's an effective list. Uh, it works really well with my style of play. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's proved itself pretty well. Uh, I think. There's possibly some wiggle room. Um, I feel like the redundancy of the the uh, swarm and the pyrovore didn't necessarily add a ton. They weren't super necessary in, in most of the games. Um, there may be some space to like pull them and maybe one of the the small zoanthropes to put something else in there. Uh, maybe get another monster. Maybe get that character with the hunting grounds. Uh, you know, a parasite with that could be interesting. Is another lone op uh, yeah. that. Is infantry so it could hop out and come back in um could be interesting there possibly a neuro tyrant to to try to get a better shadow in the warp but i don't love spending points chasing that yeah um, yeah it's a, it's quite a lot of points when you add it all together as well it is yeah it's it's what 125 points for yeah, the neuro it's another harris specs. <laughs> not dropping a harris specs for that that's for sure 
Uh, so yeah, I think the list will stay fairly similar uh, until it starts losing consistently. I'm going to keep running it. Um, Brilliant. No, absolutely. And so you should. It did. It did great. Um, was it the same list? Just quickly to touch on the teams event. Was it the Was it the same list you took for teams? No. No. So teams at Adepticon is kind of a funny one. You get a, a four person team. Uh, each person brings a thousand point list, uh, and then you're playing duos. Oh. So each round you're paired with a different one of your teammates. Uh, with your thousand point lists together, uh, so I actually ran sisters for that. Uh, oh right, so okay. Was, yeah, yeah, it was completely different. Uh, as we we're doing like a two chaos versus two imperium on our display board, had like the whole like fight between them on this like asteroid plane. Uh, so definitely right. a very different in its list. But yeah, I'll, I'll be keeping this list around. Uh, the next big event is going to be ATC. Uh, we're going to be taking a local team up there. Uh, and I'll be running this almost exactly. Brilliant. And when is that? Uh, that'll be in July. Oh, like okay, so about to that. Yep. Very cool. We'll watch out for it, man. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, super. Well, Ben, you've, you've answered everything really well, and I think a lot of the people watching would will really appreciate the uh, the insights here. It sounds like you had a really good tournament. Um, how did? The, oh, sorry. Before I before I close up, how did the painting go then? Because you had your display board, etc. Did yeah. you, do you get a score on that or anything or? Yeah, so I mean, they've, they've got like a whole painting rubric. Uh, so I got 31 points on it, which was quite good. Um, I mean, it, it, it's hard to really talk about what the scale is on that. But it, it didn't get into like any top cuts or anything, but very good painting score. Um, definitely had a lot of people coming and commenting on it and, and taking pictures, which is what I wanted. And then, of course, on the stream, people love the watermelons. So that, that was fun. Absolutely. Awesome. Great, man. Well, Really well done on the performance, and yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll look forward to ATC when when we'll next see it on the board. Um, yeah. I'm sure we'll see a lot more of that list knocking about now, as as tends to happen. If someone sees a good list and they go, "Oh, let me try it," and uh, I know yeah. I've been recommending a few people take a look at the list as well for if they're wanting to experiment in uh, Vanguard onslaught. So best of luck yeah. to them as well. Um, great stuff. Well, we'll close up there, Ben. Thanks again, um, yeah. and we'll catch you next time. Sounds great. Cheers, guys. Bye.